JJ! Yay, yeah, you're doing it! <laughs> Come on, good. Good, sit there. Hold on. Ready? Hold on. Hold on there. <laughs> yeah, hold on with your hands. That way you can stay on. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I'm going to play you a quick clip of, well, it's like almost six minutes of that podcast that Lori and Melanie are on. The date says September 7th, 2019. So I'm pretty sure that's when they recorded it, which would have been two days before she killed Ty Lee. She's on a podcast. I mean, just listen to her. Listen to what she's saying. And two days later, she kills her daughter. I mean, this is ridiculous. And there's a part of it that you could hear what I believe is JJ talking in the background. First of all, I want to give a shout out to Jenny McAloose. So she's the one that pointed this out to me, actually. Thanks, because I didn't even notice it the first time. I mean, I listened to this months ago and then again, like maybe more recently. And I just, I never even noticed JJ in the background, but she pointed that out to me and I think it is. So it was September 5th when Lori withdrew JJ from Life Academy. So that would have been two days before this podcast. So he would have been home no matter what time it was you know he wasn't at school I don't know who he's talking to in the background maybe a friend could be Ty Lee that he's talking to I don't know let me know what you guys think they're doing a podcast which since this is on September 7th Melanie was probably not because Melanie went to Rexburg to visit Lori September 19th so I don't think Melanie was actually physically with her I mean you know how like I do lives and have guests and you don't have to be physically with them so I'm sure podcast works that way I'm, I'm not sure because I never used that app podcast to do like a podcast so I'll timestamp it in the description where you could hear him. And also I wanted to point out how she talks about her ex-husband. Listen to what she says. I'm thinking she's probably talking about Charles because this was after that whole drama and she has her brother shoot him. I mean, come on. And all the claims that she made about him. I think it's kind of interesting that she brings him up on this podcast. But I'm only going to play you like five and a half minutes of it where Lori talks most of the time. Okay, so here it is. If I can be more perfect, then that causes him less suffering. Did, don't you yeah. think that? Like, yeah. did you think that yeah, when you were younger? Like, I could be more yeah. perfect, and then if I do everything perfectly, then it's like Jesus has a little bit less pain, yeah. and I don't want to be the one to cause him pain. No, it's not how it works. But that is how it works. But and I didn't know that until I started figuring it out through the Spirit. And one of the clues is like, how would I know? Because I remember when I was in pain, suffering before my experience, I remember going... Well, what does this mean when King Benjamin says this in chapter 4 and verse 10 and 11? But I'm going to start with 11 actually this time because we already talked about repenting and forsaking our sins. But he said, as you have um, come to the knowledge of the glory of God, that mm -hmm. you've known of his goodness and have tasted of his love mm. and have received a remission of your this sins, which causeth, here's enough. the qualifier here, such exceedingly great joys in your souls. And that's mm. when I said to myself, you don't have joy. You haven't repented, Melanie, mm. because you're not having this joy. That was a huge clue for me. Right, because I you, it out. but you were literally miserable. I was. So what is the opposite of joy? Is it misery? It is, Lord, no. is it misery? Like, I hate my life. Yep. This isn't going right. What am I doing here? This has all gone awry. That's how I felt in my life. Like, this life has gone awry. Like, I, <laughs> this is not happening. <laughs> this is out of control. And I can't handle this. And this is not how it was supposed to go. And this is not what I signed up for. Like, I was thinking all those things. And not being accountable, like you were saying. Like, not taking responsibility. Like, you know what? I made this choice. And this was actually a consequence of this. Yep. But it was part of what I designed before I came to this life. So that I could learn those kinds of valuable lessons. So I tend to be now more like when something goes wrong, because things still go wrong, right. right? And I tend to be like, what do I need to learn from this? Mm -hmm. What's this experience about? What do I need to learn from this so that I can overcome it quicker mm -hmm. instead of taking 10 years like exactly. of being miserable yep. and have joy? How can, I, how can I learn from this so that I can move on and have joy all the time? What you're learning is to trust in your journey. Mm. That's what I felt, is you start mm. to trust. And I, I orchestrated this because before we were like, why is our life stink so badly? 
we must have done something really bad. Like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. But then, now that we have more light and understanding, we're thinking, oh, that was perfect. This is perfectly what I needed. Right, because you can look back. I can even look back at my ex-husband and think of all the misery, like, that he caused in my mind at the time, which I still have to say he, he has point was to cause misery, but his job was to cause me misery. But I could have had joy that whole time, but I look back on it now and think that was exactly what I needed. It was exactly what I needed because I needed to learn a lot of valuable lessons out of that. And when you're, when you are miserable, um, and you don't understand it, like we, we tend to blame God, right? Like, why did you do this to me? Why did you put me here? This is a horrible situation. And whether we put ourselves in that situation or not, the answer is the same. He's like, you designed this. You chose these challenges. You chose these trials because you know what you needed to become successful. And you know what you needed to overcome in this life so that you can move on and have eternal progression. Exactly. And he wants us to learn that you can do this with me. And then he wants us, I like what you said, to feel successful. Because anytime we we're obedient, we feel so happy. Mm-hmm. There's something happy. Joy does come yeah. from obedience. There is joy. There is Absolutely. joy in obedience. And I love that about Heavenly Father. I think, you know, you grow up as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you think, um, you think it's so restrictive right right you think your life especially as a teenager right you think your life is so restrictive you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this but you learn over time that through that obedience comes that joy because then you're not hard on yourself and it's not even you it's the dark ones who are telling you oh you messed that up it's over for you you're done you're done you know i told that to the 16 year olds i was teaching and i said raise your hand if you feel like you've done something so wrong that it's over and you're done And they all raised their hand. Mm. And there was like 22 of them. Mm. And they all raised their hand that they felt like at 16, they had already done something that's so wrong that they're done. And I explained to them the atonement and what it really meant. And what that he's paid for everything you've ever done or everything you're going to do. And that all he wants you to do is say you're sorry and do better the next day. And move on because those are experiences that you're having. And these kids did not understand that concept. And they were, you know, the perfectionism that we put on our kids today yeah. is really bad. Absolutely. It's hard for them. And so we thought it was restrictive, but really if you are obedient to those commandments and you're able to be obedient to those commandments, then you feel more joy and then the adversary cannot use those little things against you. Okay, so I want to discuss two more things. Actually, things I have talked about in my previous videos, but like I said, I'm trying to bring out some of these things that I've already went over like way back that a lot of people haven't seen that been asking me about. So I'm going to talk about a couple things. And then I realized as I'm doing these videos, I haven't, most of my other videos, I was like in front of the camera and I haven't been in front of the camera in like months now. All my new subscribers don't even know what I look like if they haven't seen some of my old videos. They're used to my new videos where I'm just kind of putting up pictures and videos and having other visuals and I'm not in front of the camera but I my next video I'm going to get in front of the camera because I kind of miss it it's been a while and anyway now that I've rambled on let's get into the business here oh and also my next few videos well I'll read them in front of the camera but also I have more of those documents that I'm going to be going over from WTAF um so I want to go read those to you too so that's my next few videos after this I'm going to read you some of the documents from the Joseph Ryan case documents with uh, Joseph versus Lori they were going through the divorce and then the custody battle stuff and all that mess and drama with Colby and Tylee and just there's a bunch of stuff so I'm going to go over those coming up so look look for those guys okay let's get into this real quick so first of all I read this article wait a long time ago when I was a little bit confused because I didn't realize that Charles was actually married three times so he was married to a lady named Kimberly Friedmutter that was his first wife and then Cheryl Wheeler was his second and then Lori. So Kimberly Friedmutter, his very first wife, actually did an interview. So I'm going to read you this article. So it says Kimberly Friedmutter, who I want to add, went on to become a actress, author, and celebrity hypnotist who was married to Charles Vallow in the mid-1980s. 
said the discovery of the missing kids confirms 100% Charles was murdered. It has really now become very scary and very evil and very wrong, Friedmutter 57 told the outlet. But Friedmutter believes the shooting was a hit job orchestrated by Lori and matches Charles' own prediction of his impending death. So this is what he tells his attorney, Steve. I'm telling you, Steve. So that if something happens to me, I want to make sure you let everyone know that something happens. I'm killed, that it's my wife Lori and her brother Alex Cox. Charles allegedly told his attorney Stephen Ellsworth shortly before he died. Friedmutter divorced Charles early on in their relationship when she discovered six months after they were married that he was cheating on her. In the wake of the mysterious string of deaths surrounding Lori, Friedmutter now regrets that decision, saying Charles could still be alive today if she hadn't pursued a divorce. There wouldn't have been other wives and there wouldn't have been Lori if I had stayed with him. This wouldn't even ever have occurred. He would still be alive. So yeah, he was married three times. Doesn't sound like he was married to her very long because she said, what, six months after they were married, she found out he was cheating and she left him. So that's that. And then another thing I'm not sure if some of you guys, I'm, I know I should say, I'm not sure if all of you guys are aware of this. I know some of you guys are aware of that fight that Lori and Alex got in, but not everybody is aware of this. So that's why I wanted to do a video just talking about that real quick. So Lori and Alex got in this huge fight, I guess. I'm going to read you a couple parts of this article first about the fight, and then I'm going to tell you my theory on what I think that the fight was about. So make sure you you listen after and um, hear what my theory is on what the fight was about, and then tell me what you think about it. If you agree with me or if you have your own theory, because I would like to hear your guys' theories too. Okay, so here's the article. The title is, Mother of a Missing Idaho Kids Had Explosive Fight in the Middle of the Street with Her Killer Brother Before His Mysterious Death screaming and accusing him of bringing disgrace on their family. Lori Vallow had an explosive fight with her brother Alex Cox while she lived with him in the Phoenix suburb of Santan Valley, never returning after the blow up. The fight between the siblings was so bad that the neighbors were close to calling the police on them, said the neighbor. Neighbor Donnie Self said people were coming out in the street to watch. She was screaming at him, accusing him of bringing disgrace on their family. Missing Idaho kid's mom, Lori Vallow, had a knockdown, drag out fight in the middle of the street with her killer brother. I heard this huge commotion. Neighbor Donnie Self told Daily Mail, people were coming out in the street to watch what was going on. I thought they must be husband and wife because it was the sort of fight you don't normally have with your sister. She was screaming at him, accusing him of bringing disgrace on their family. After it was over, Vallow left the house she had been sharing with her brother in the Phoenix suburb of Santan Valley and never came back, Self said. The explosive fight occurred around a year ago. I joke with my wife that I thought he might have killed her after their argument, Self said. He married Zulema Pestinez, 55, in Las Vegas on December 2nd. His widow did not return calls from DailyMail.com and did not come to the door at her home in Gilbert. However, her son confirmed she and Cox had married shortly before his death. I wanted to point out that part because I just did that video where I read those transcripts and if you remember, Joseph, Zulema's son, says that Alex is his mom's boyfriend. Why didn't he say it was her husband if he knew they were married? I mean, I don't understand. He didn't, did he or didn't he know they were married? And if he did, why wouldn't he say that to the 911 operator? And if he didn't, he told Daily Mail they were. Looks like he did know they were married. It just confuses me kind of the way he acts on that. Okay, let me continue with the article. So the neighbor self said Cox, who had a history of violent assaults, was very unfriendly and tried to avoid contact with his neighbors on the quiet residential street. One day I was doing some yard work in the front and he drove his Ford pickup into the front. I waved and tried to say hello, but he ignored me and just went inside. Self said that at one point Cox was away from the four bedroom single story home for six weeks and left the garage door open for the entire time. It's a good job we are a quiet law-abiding community because he had a lot of stuff in there and none of it got stolen. 
When he returned to the home, which is now empty and up for rent, he moved everything out of the garage so he could fit his truck in. I think he just wanted to get straight into the house without having to see any of his neighbors, said self. Okay, so I wanted to read that to you guys and tell you my theory of what I think the fight was about. But first, I have to set up the timeline so you understand what was going on in that time period. So if you look at the date of this article, it's in January, and he says that it was about a year ago when this fight took place. About a year ago, he's saying from that article. So around January, February, that's about a year. He's just giving an estimation. So I'm thinking this fight probably took place the middle of February, around that time, in the year 2019. So let's not forget, January 22nd is when Chad allegedly wrote Lori that email about Charles being basically overtaken by this Nick or Ned Schneider, that it wasn't really Charles in his body anymore. So that is when the wheels started turning, when Lori started basically planning his death. Because what do they think? The only way to save Charles' soul that's in limbo is to kill the physical body. So that's when they started planning his death. And then it was January 30th that Charles comes home to a locked up house and then he calls the cops and has that order for her to stay at Community Bridges. And then the next day, January 31st, 2019, is when Lori goes to the police station and reports that Charles stole her purse. But remember, a couple of days before that is where she takes his money. She takes $2,500 out of his bank account. She cancels his flight. She hides his truck. She threatens that she's going to kill him. And then she, he steals her purse and that whole ordeal. When she leaves and disappears for 58 days, she goes to stay with Alex. And then on February 10th, she flies out to Hawaii to stay with her friend April for a few days. She's with Ty Lee. She brings Ty Lee with her. And then she's supposed to be going to that preparing a people event on February 16th. At least Charles thought she was going there because he's trying to serve her with the divorce papers, remember? He's trying to track her down. Charles thinks that Lori changed her plans because she was on to him that he was trying to serve her with the divorce papers. And she didn't want that because she wanted that life insurance money because she had a goal in her mind to kill Charles and get that life insurance money. She knows the minute they get a divorce, she's not going to be the beneficiary. So anyway, she avoids the servers. She avoids getting the papers for the divorce. I don't know if she went to that conference or not, but that was Chad's last conference that he spoke at. So Chad was at that February 16th preparing a people conference in Boise, Idaho. And here's a statement put out by the preparing of people. Okay, so I'm going to read you the statement real quick. Statement on recent news events. This is the statement they put out on December 26, 2019. We are a small multimedia company, Color by Media, that has provided services to a variety of clients for about seven years. Preparing a People was a series of lecture events focusing on self-reliance and personal preparation. These provided several LDS speakers and authors an educational forum. Associated with these events were podcasts, videos, and websites used to advertise and distribute some of their content. Chad Daybell was an author and began publishing books over 20 years ago under the name of Spring Creek Book Company. He spoke at some of the Preparing a People events, but had no ownership in it, nor was he a founder. Mr. Daybell was simply one of many speakers at the events. His last speaking engagement was back in February of 2019 in Boise, Idaho. Like all of our speakers, we help promote the events by interviewing Interviewing and podcasting interviews with our speakers, including but in no way exclusively to Mr. Debo. The majority of our work in 2019 has been contract video editing working for other companies. This has nothing to do with Mr. Debo. We decided in early spring of 2019 to close out our preparing of people commitments and moved back to Utah from Rexburg, Idaho to work with clients based in the Utah area which has always been the bulk of our work. None of this had anything to do with Mr. Daybell. I'm not sure if Lori did go to that conference, but as far as them being able to find her to serve the papers at the airport, they couldn't find her. But they went to Alex's home in Santan, the same home that the neighbors saw them fighting at. And I guess the server saw both cars in the driveway. He saw Lori's and Alex's car, but supposedly they said Lori was a home. So 
I think she really was there that day that they saw her car. I think, yeah, around that time is when they got in that fight. So remember, let me just summarize it real quick. She goes to Hawaii, February 10th, comes back around the 16th, maybe goes to the conference in Boise, Idaho, not sure. But it was around that time that the server saw Lori's car in Alex's driveway. He was trying to serve her with divorce papers. Okay, so it was sometime after that that Alex and Lori got in that fight. So now that I set up the timeline, we see this was right around the time that Charles and Lori were having some major issues. They were fighting. She was threatening to kill him. Charles said that Lori said when he came home, she was going to kill him and the angel was going to dispose of his body. So then Lori says to Charles, that he's going to have to go painfully. What kind of evil person says that to somebody? That you'll have to go painfully. So what does that tell you that her and Alex's argument was about? She's already wanting him dead, right? So her plan, she's got to get her plan going on about how are they going to get rid of Charles, right? So she disappears for 58 days without JJ, leaves JJ with Charles, and she takes Ty Lee, okay? This is the time when her and Alex got in that fight. So what could that fight be about? Think about it. I think Lori was asking Alex to kill Charles for her. Alex was refusing and hesitant and probably saying no way, you know, at first. Like, what? But then Lori had some time to convince him and brainwash him with these zombie ideas and beliefs that Chad was making up through his stupid visions. And it sounds like Alex fell for it. Because Melanie Gibbs said that Alex believed him like 100%. For some reason, I think that Alex did believe and trust Lori after she kind of convinced him about these ideas. But I think it took a little bit. I think that was the argument and he was saying no at first and arguing about it. And she won. She got her way. You know, he gave in. It just makes too much sense that it was right around that time that her and Charles were having issues and she wanted to kill Charles. She even said that she was going to kill him. She wanted him to die. And then, okay, so I'm going to add this little part in here because this is after my live. <laughs> I had recorded all the previous stuff before my live. And uh, shout out to Alma. She informed me that Nate, I guess, possibly, that she remembers son, um, Nate from East Idaho News saying something about maybe the argument had something to do with Alex being gay. And that's why Lori was saying to Alex, you're a disgrace to the family. So after I thought about it, I was like, hmm. So I still think the argument could have been about him refusing to kill Charles for her. And because of that, Lori taking a little childish jab at him starts bringing up his sexuality about being gay. And, you know, tries to get him that way. Like, you know, you're a disgrace to the family because you're gay or whatever. So taking like the immature little pokes at him because he's refusing to freaking kill her husband. Oh my God. So yeah, after I thought about that, I was like, you know what? I still do think that the fight does did have something to do with Alex refusing to go along with Lori's wishes on what she wants him to do to Charles. And then that just turned into some name calling type thing. Because I mean, Lori's immature like that. We see from her past, I mean, she would use whatever means she needs to get her own way. So yeah, she would bring up his sexuality and, and make fun of him and say he's a disgrace to the family if he's not going along with what she wants. So yeah, that probably was what she was referring to when at that on that line when she said you're a disgrace to the family. It probably was about him being gay maybe. But I still think the main reason that fight started was because of that. I think I really do for some reason. I think Lori was asking Alex to kill Charles. So that's then after that fight with Alex, she leaves. I'm thinking she went back to Hawaii sometime after the fight with Alex. Well, maybe not right after because if they had just gotten in a fight, maybe she went and stayed in a hotel for a couple days or something just to get away. And then what if then she goes back to Hawaii and she takes Alex with her? Because remember April, like I was saying before, April says how she 
was going to come back and she wanted to stay with April, but she didn't stay with April that second time she came back. So maybe she did go back and she took Alex with her. You try to get somebody to do something, they won't do it. So let's take him to Hawaii and spoil him and show him a good time and work on him a little bit, talk him into it, uh, convince him, spend some money on him in Hawaii and make him, you know, kind of feel guilty like he owes Lori something. Nice vacation to Hawaii. Alex will be like, oh, well, she, look, she, see, you know, took me to Hawaii and he'll feel like he is indebted to her, that he owes her something. The thing that made me think that is because when the neighbor said that he was gone for around six weeks, at one time. I just wonder if after that he went with Lori wherever she went for the 58 days or the rest of the time she was gone basically. So I'm not sure whether he went to Hawaii with her or not but I do think that that fight was about her asking him to kill Charles. This is just my opinion. It's just my theory that that's what the fight was about. So if any of you guys found any information about whether she went back to Hawaii that second time so did she go back a second time in those 58 days that she disappeared? Because we know she went on February 10th with Ty Lee and she stayed with April for a few days. Because do you remember that interview where April said she asked her if she could stay with her again because she was coming back? I'm pretty sure April either said no or she just didn't respond to her. Because I don't think she stayed with April a second time, but I'm not sure if she went back a second time. So if she did, that's what I'm thinking. If she did go back the second time, maybe she took Alex with her. But... I'm not sure about that. Okay guys, that's all I have for you on this video. So yeah, let me know what you think about my theory about what the argument was about and also about the podcast if you think it was JJ in the background. Okay, thanks for watching guys. Have a good day. Bye.